what is going on everybody this is the front and it is your clash of champions review reaction show clash of champions just went off the air more not more than 10 15 minutes ago i believe talking smack is still going on the network right now but we don't have time for that and if i want to watch it i'll watch it later nothing really to review there we had an interesting show tonight it wasn't the best show i've ever seen but it wasn't the worst show of the year, I will tell you that right now. That is still to battleground, and that will be the worst pay-per-view of 2017 that we have seen all year. This show was, it had its ups, it had its downs, and Christmas was saved. AJ Styles, we will just say it now, AJ Styles is still your WWE Champion. We'll get into that match later. We also had a shocking new champion, which nobody, I bet you nobody, who did preview predictions or any type of predictions guessed. That we would have a new United, the new United States champion that we got. It was a good match. The real down part of the show, I believe, was the women's match. I mean, most uh, most lumberjack matches are a downturn, so it wasn't a real surprise. But that was just a dumpster fire all around. And there was Natalia at the end of that match. Gave us a little bit of something that I didn't, I don't think any of us saw coming, and I don't know what it means. But she, I don't know if she retired or what. It just sounded so weird tonight that she just, the promo she gave us and everything. We'll get to that when we do. But other than that, this wasn't, that, this show was not bad. It, the women's match, of course, was the lowest part of the show. The tag team match, the Fatal 4-Way tag team match was hectic as can be. The Bludgeon Brothers, no business as usual, with a little bit, they did take a little bit of damage tonight, so they are starting to get that acclimation into being a team that can beat people up, but also take the punishment. That was what the that's what Brizongo was for. It was a good thing they didn't start off against Brizongo. But, and I hope Breeze, I hope Tyler Breeze's face did not get um, too messed up tonight, because that, that spot on the outside looked brutal. We will start with the pre-show tonight, and we had Mojo Rowley and Zack Ryder. Both, both, both guys had new music. Zack Ryder had, like, updated remix version of his Woo Woo Woo, You Know It, and all that. It sounded a more and more remix. Mojo Rowley had some new music. No, I don't get hype. I stay hype garbage that he usually has. He then gets down in a three-point stance and just charges to the ring. I'm like, what is this? Ryder, for the most part of this match, had control. He did get two broski boots for a two count. And the finish of the match came with a chop block to Ryder's knee from Mojo Valley. Mojo Valley hits him with that forearm, running forearm fist in the corner for a three count. And that was your pre-show match. Mojo Valley taunts Zack Ryder after the match. Not, like, when Zack Ryder, when Mojo Valley did have control, he was taunting Zack Ryder for the majority of this match. But it was a pre-show match. Not much there to talk about. And I honestly don't see Mojo Valley going anywhere. I hope they prove me wrong. But a good showing if you, I guess. Then we had the regular show. We start off with the United States Championship. Graham Corbin versus Bobby Roode versus Dolph Ziggler. In a match I didn't see the ending coming. I did not expect this match, this match to go the way it did. But before we get into the match, I have got to say, please turn Bobby, heel, uh, Bobby Roode heel. This guy... Throughout his entire wrestling career, back in his TNA days, not really a good babyface on his own. I mean, him and James Storms, when they were babyfaces, beer money, that's one thing. But Bobby Roode's, Bobby Roode is like a Triple H when it comes to heel or face. He is a great heel. He just, he just flounders, I feel, as a babyface. As soon as they turn this guy heel, then it would be better for him and all of WWE. I don't care what his music, which has... If you have noticed, the glorious singing with to his music has kind of gone down. They Dolph Ziggler came out to the like scratching of the record, no music anymore. After they had him on Tuesday come out with his music, he looked like he was in I don't care mode again. Even though he had his hair slicked back and everything, it looked like he was ready for this match. I will say this, Corbin. Not too many people were too happy about Corbin having the U.S. title, but this guy at least showed that he was proud. He was he had pride in being champion. Yes, he shoved it in our faces, but uh, the two mid-card champions until this night that had the titles, I, Roman Reigns compared to Baron Corbin. Baron Corbin looks like he at least cared, cared about being champion, as long, even though he had to shove it in our face. He held it 
like it meant something to him. Roman Reigns, of course, throws the titles over his shoulder and just like, it's just a prop. And when it comes to a triple threat match or a multi-man match for the title, why do they have to continue to tell us the odds of the champion? We all know this. This isn't, if it was like the first time this chant, this match ever happened, then fine. But this was just like enough. Enough of like, oh, only 33% of the, of, for Baron Corbin to win the championship. This match started out with Rude and Corbin. Like, they were all three, you know how it is. Triple threat match, all three guys sizing each other up. All of a sudden, Z Rude and Ziggler turned to Baron Corbin and just start attacking him. They clothesline him. They get him outside. They clothesline him over the barricade and start taking it, like, taking to each other. They both get a, end up getting a two count on each other. Rude is sent to the outside, and out back comes Van Corbin laying out Bobby Rude. Corbin and, Corbin and gets Rude into the ring because Bob, Dolph Ziggler tried to attack Van Corbin. Van Corbin kicked him in the face, I believe, and then shoved ben, Bobby Rude into the barricade and then threw him inside. Corbin with the really strong, um, strong, um, uh. Throwing, taking Bobby Roode from one side of the corner, from one corner to another, very strongly, and Corbin and Roode selling that very well. Corbin got in control for a good bit of this match. Corbin head outside and rams Ziggler into the barricade. Back in Roode kicks and chops his way back into this match. Sidewalk slam by Corbin, broken up by Ziggler for a two count. Shot by Corbin, rocks Ziggler. Corbin with stomps to Ziggler. Rude ends up getting the best of Ziggler for a minute in this match. Rude hits the blockbuster for a two count. That is a if it hits it right, that is a beautiful move by Bobby Rude, that blockbuster. Always a great move. Ziggler hits the famous for a two count. We did, if I'm correct, we saw a Tower of, Tower of Doom in this match because you have to see those in every multi-man match, it seems like. I believe we didn't in the tag team match, but we'll get to that when we do. Corbin does rip his shirt off. He's like, I'm done with this. Get this thing off of me. He yells for Rude and runs and clotheslines him. Both guys in the corner, but then gets kicked and gets kicked and chopped and ends up hitting a deep six on Ziggler for a two count. After that, Ruben, Bobby Rude chants just all through the crowd by this time. Bobby Rude is over when he's actually given time. Corbin has Rude on the top rope, top turnbuckle. Rude stops him. Ziggler jumps up and attempts a superplex. And, of course, we get the Tower of Doom, which you will see in most, if not all, of multi-man matches, which I wish they would retire the, the Tower of Doom from competition right now because it's been overused, overdone, and it's come to the point where if we're in a triple threat, fatal four-way, fatal five-way, it's like, if it doesn't happen, it'd be weird. So, we have to sit there and just be like, when's the Tower of Doom coming? Oh, that guy's up on the, on the top rope. Oh, that guy's going to. Oh, here comes the Tower of Doom. That's just how it is now, and it's... It's overdone, overused, and I'm just kind of... I love the Tower of Doom when it happens once in a blue moon, not every single time. So, Corbin tried to chokeslam back leg and, said, and misses. Corbin gets sent to the outside into the post by Dolph Ziggler. He is tuning up for the super kick. Misses and Rude with a spine buster, that beautiful double-A spine buster he loves to do. DDT from Ziggler for a two count. After he blocks the glorious DDT, Corbin back in, throws Ziggler outside, but Ziggler holds on. Match ends when glorious DDT, Corbin tries to steal the pinfall like he did in Hell in a Cell. Gets thrown to the outside. Rude gets a two count when Corbin pulls him outside. Choke slam backbreaker to Rude by Corbin, who throws Rude into the end of day. Starts to do the end of days, and this was something I didn't expect to see. Rude is getting got ready to get hit with the end of days when Dolph Ziggler comes up behind and hits a zigzag on Baron Corbin for the 1-2-3. And your new champion is Dolph Ziggler. None of us, and I swear, none of us, I guarantee, and I don't think anyone saw Dolph Ziggler winning this match. Maybe this is setting up for him to lose it to somebody else not named Baron Corbin. And we could see, like, see maybe a Jinder Mahal win the title. Or somebody who's like we haven't seen win the title, who we think should win the title. It's... And then we had, so before we get to the next match, I don't know where they go from this from here for Dolph Ziggler. I didn't expect it. I don't think anybody expected Dolph Ziggler to win this match. With how things went tonight, and we already said it, Jinder Mahal loses his match. I could see maybe at the Royal Rumble, Jinder Mahal wins the U.S. title. And I would, if he does that, 
keep that title on him, give him something to have until SummerSlam and he can lose it there. Don't do this thing where it's like Jinder Mahal wins the title at the Royal Rumble. He wins the U.S. title in the pre-show match, most likely, and takes it to WrestleMania, loses it to, Do to John Cena, and is back down to Purgatory. If you really want to give Jinder Mahal something to do, he lost the night, give him the U.S. title at the Royal Rumble, have him actually beat John Cena, because John Cena is the time of his career where he needs to start putting people over like he did to Roman Reigns back, in, back I believe, is No Mercy. He doesn't need to. John Cena could lose every single match he's in for the rest of his career, and he wouldn't. it wouldn't hurt his legacy one, one iota. So I feel Dolph Ziggler is holding this title for maybe a Jinder Mahal, maybe somebody else. I don't know. Then we had the tag team fatal four way before anyone else come out. You hear this weird opera singing woman and you just hear Aiden English and it's like I that's just weird to hear. The first time I heard it was at Tribute to the Troops, which I did watch, no reason to review it was not for me, it was for the troops, but it's like I've never heard that before. We got the twelve days of Rusev, which I didn't remember to write them down, so I found it funny how the third day was the three unhindered genders, which that's just funny. Fatal 4 way match for the SmackDown Live Tag Team Championships. Usos versus Aiden English versus Rusev. And Aiden English and Rusev versus the New Day versus the Minnesota Wrestling Crew, as I'm calling them. I like the crew. I like the name that Corey Graves gave them a couple pay per views ago. The Minnesota Wrestling Crew of Chad Gable and Jason Jordan. Somebody fight me for it. I like it. Rusev is so over in this. In, was so over in this pay per view. He actually got a bigger pop than Daniel Bryan. And that's, the same, that's saying something. It's hard to get a pop like, bigger than Daniel Bryan when Daniel Bryan comes out. And Daniel Bryan got his usual pop, but Rusev got a huge pop. And what is with WWE and changing the way they the rules for these matches that they do? We had a Fatal 4-Way tag team match and two referees in a match, in a, in a tag team match later on the show. And it was four men in this ring at the same time, and they can only tag their tag team partners. When it's usually a Fatal 4-Way, it's one man each, and they can tag whoever they want. And in that match, it was both referees in the ring at the same time, which I that was a that was a cluster for a while. We'll get to that when we do. Gable J, English, and Kofi started the match. This match was hard, was just so hectic. It was hard to like write down anything. This match was crazy. There was a, we got a double cover by Usos by by one of the Usos and Biggie for a two count. The match ended, and this was great. We had. The match pretty much came to an end. There was it was all hectic, hard to keep control. But the biggest part of this match was Rusev. The crowd wanted Rusev and Aiden English to win this match. I put something on Twitter before this match ended, before this match started. If Rusev and Aiden English were to won this match, and I think the reason they didn't win this match was simply because of this. If they were to won this match, and Rusev gets the pinfall or the submission, that place would have been so nuts they would have been dead for the rest of the show. That's how over Rusev is. I, I never thought I'd see the day that Rusev, out of all of the people on SmackDown Live, is one of the is the second most over person in on SmackDown Live. And yes, he is more over than AJ Styles, even though we we respect AJ Styles, but when it comes to being over, this guy is over. And I, and like you hear Rusev Day, they were cheering Aiden English, which I didn't think that was gonna happen. Like they were wanting a um, encore. He asked, "Do you want an encore?" And they just like blew up wanting an encore. This match was crazy. Over and all, match ended after we pretty much had Biggie was in the in the um um in in the camel clutch by um by Rusev. He's trying to get up. Rusev stops him from getting up. Chad Gable comes behind Rusev and just. Superplexes, like back, like suplexes this guy. He suplex, back suplexes this, like Rusev. He back suplexes Big E. He back suplexes like both of the um, like Aiden English, Kofi. I believe one of the Usos, maybe not. Like he was just having a a um par a um suplex party. Someone on Twitter put we have a new um suplex machine, like a suplex city machine or whatever, a human suplex machine. No, not really, but. He was just having a ball. He showed his strength in this match and why he should have been the guy who took, who has Jason Jordan's spot on Raw. Just saying. He gets all that done and then we have a super kick party by the Usos. 
Super kicks all over the place. They super kick Gable twice. Then you get the Uso splash for the win. The Usos retain the tag team titles in a great match that you have to go back to see. Both first, the first two matches did not disappoint. Like they exceeded expectations for the U.S. title match. It was better than I thought it was going to be, but it was a pretty good match. This match, I expected it to be hectic, and it was. You had four men at the, in the ring at the same time, two part, the partners on the outside. It was one heck of a match. You have to go back and see this match. This match was, it like, it, it's hard to explain how good this match was. Usos, of course, showing, Usos showing how good they are. Rusev is over the, so many times, like when he was, when he was in the match, the crowd was all for him. When he wasn't in the match, it was just whatever, but, like, it came close. When it looked like they were going to win the match, and I was sitting here thinking, are they going to give him the titles? Because he had, they, they, he had the, um, the, the camel clutch, as I'm calling him now, because I can't remember what he calls it. He had the camel clutch on, I believe it was Gable, on, uh, not Gable, but Benjamin, and the crowd was just like, they want this win, they want this win. But, no. Then he gets it on Big E, because Big E stopped that. And you could just feel like if that match would have ended right there in Big E taps, that was going to be a massive win for the for That was going to be a massive pop. Would have been the biggest pop of the night and the biggest pop we would have seen in a long time. But in the end, the Usos won. Not, not too mad about that. The Usos, I think, are going to end up losing the titles to the Bludgeon Brothers by Royal Rumble season. Or if we get to WrestleMania, which I don't know if you're going to keep the Bludgeon Brothers out for that long. But they will definitely... Definitely be winning winning the tag titles from the Usos. If it wasn't for the Bludgeon Brothers, I have a feeling we might have seen the tag team title change to the Usos and the new like to the new day, not to the new day, but to the uh -oh, have an uh -oh, to Rusev yeah. and Aiden. It just felt like they should have been there, but they won. Then we had the worst match of the night, in my opinion. Why? And this is something that just kind of bugged me. What lumberjack match have you seen where there are only seven lumberjacks and they get each and every one of their entrances for this match? The Rat Squad did, Naomi did, Carmella did, Tamina and um, Lana got their entrances too. I'm like, are they trying to pad this time? I mean, yes, the match, the, the show ended a little bit before 11, but did they really need to pad time by having both, all three members? Like everyone, not just all three ones, but everyone getting their own entrances. It just felt kind of weird. And what kind of lumberjack match has only seven lumberjacks? Yes, I know that was it was a bad idea, very bad idea. I mean, last time there was a lumberjack women's match, it was back when they were so called be calling divas, and that match at least had enough lumberjacks to fill each side. Heck, you had Naomi over on one side. Uh, by the way, you had the. The team, the, the, the trio of Carmella, Lana, and Tamina on the other side. And in, in on the opposite side of the hard cam, you had the Riot Squad with nobody on the hard cam side. And what I want to know is, and I didn't bring this up earlier, and I should have. What was that little camera, that, was, that little tripod with that camera, and the two cameras, because I think they were cameras, and there was two holes, so I'm thinking it was some, some kind of VR. What is with the cameras that were there, actually, the two that were on the pipe, and the one that was out by, out, out on the hard cam side? Were they building, were they, like, taping this for hard camera, for, like, some kind of uh, VR experience? Watch WWE Clash of Champions on PSVR or on Oculus Rift and all this stuff. I don't know. It just felt kind of weird. I have no idea what it was, but that was just weird. Match pretty much, and I really didn't care about this match. Match ends with the Wyatt Squad and the Lumberjacks brawling. Naomi jumps off the top rope to knock everyone else out. They were beaten down. Basically, Charlotte got one, had one ally in Naomi, which I guess they're best friends now. They're best friends. And because, you know, Becky Lynch is going to be back till January, I guess she had to have some friend. She beat that, she kicked um, Naomi, um, shut Natalia a lot while she was out there. And then she, like, whenever, whenever Charlotte was thrown to the other side, to the other women, all of them beat down on Charlotte and not, didn't do anything to, to Natty. So, I have no idea 
what they were doing. But, yes. Match, Natty goes for a sharpshooter and rope break Charlotte, which it is what it is. Charlotte gets pulled out of the ring and everyone is brawling in the typical fashion. Carmella comes in the ring with her briefcase that looked like we might have a cash in. But it was just a tease. Get used to it, ladies and gentlemen, because that's the only thing we're going to get from Carmella for probably till Money in the Bank next year. She's probably not going to cash in. They gave her the Money in the Bank, line, the money in the bank and I honestly don't think they had anything for her because she hasn't done, like, any other time, like, someone's, like, somebody, besides this year, when somebody has the money in the bank, you see them tease and tease and tease and tease that they're going to cash in until they finally cash in. You didn't really have, you don't really have that with Carmelo, and Baron Corbin didn't have it long enough to be able to do that enough. Everyone gets in the ring when Carmelo, Carmelo comes in the ring with her briefcase. Ruby Wyatt comes in and just knocks on her. All of them brawl in the ring, typical fashion, typical, typical fashion. Charlotte throws Natty outside to do her moonsault. I swear it's in her contract that says that every match you have, you must do a moonsault to the outside or into the inside. It was unnecessary and not needed. She didn't need it. Somehow, I guess she missed Natalia. Natalia throws her in for a sharpshooter. She gets... Charlotte reverses that into a figure eight and gets the tap out. Your winner and still women's champion is Charlotte Flair. Only get a tap... We're only going to get a tease for a cash in because that's how WWE wants to play it. Post-match, Natty, Natty is interviewed. She looks so emotional on her face and is asked what went wrong. She said she did nothing wrong and Charlotte used her family's name to cut corners. I have no idea what she's talking about. She, she didn't make the, mat, the Lumberjack match. That was Daniel Bryan. You can go talk to him. And she has given some of the... She says she has given some of the best, best matches the women have ever seen. I wouldn't say that. Not all... Like, most of her matches have been just awful. She is cringe. I'm just saying. She is cringe anytime she was on the mic, anytime you see her match, you she's like, yay, and all that stuff. It's just cringe. And she says she's, we have, like, we've turned our back on her. The other women have turned their back on her. And since that's all happening, she's turning her back on us, all of us. Which, I don't know what that means. She gets out of the ring and she's just falling. It looked like she might have just had her last match in WWE. I don't know. Her, her comments of... I'm not, I'm turning my back on you guys now is usually what a baby face would say when they're on a losing streak and the crowd starts turning against them like you would see like a John Cena if John Cena were to turn to you or something like that. You don't usually have a heel sit there and be like, well, you guys turn your back on me. I'm turning my back on you. That's just not how that usually works. But, so I don't know what to think of it. Let me know in the comment section below what you think is going on with Natalia because honestly, I have no clue. Then we had the Fashion Police, Brizongo versus the Bludgeon Brothers. It's about time we saw Brizongo. It took six-ish months, six months before Brizongo actually had a pay-per-view match that wasn't on the pre-show. Wasn't that much of a match, but I would have to say, towards the end of the match, because they, they got a little bit of offense on um, Harper, on Rowan, but they were outside getting beat down. They pit, Brizongo, like, Tyler Breeze, is down, Eric Rowan picks him up, pulls him up, and just slams his face, looks like it, right on the edge of the ring. I hope he doesn't have, he needs some rhinoplasty or something, because that looked brutal. Match ends with a full Nelson powerbomb, which I think should be the finisher, because that looks way more devastating than this double um, powerbomb thing that they do, where they hold one arm each, pick up, and throw him down. The full Nelson into that um, sit-out powerbomb combo, that looks so much better, and I think that should be the finisher. I don't know why it's not, but maybe someone in WWE will be like, that full Nelson powerbomb should be your finisher now. Promo from these two, talking about how there's more pain, more um, more reckoning to come from the Bludgeon Brothers, which honestly, they didn't need to pull that promo out. I think they should just be quiet and just wreck havoc, which I know we can't have much of. Then we had, I think, the craziest match of the night, Owens and Zayn versus Shinsuke Nakamura and Randy Orton. I was real surprised they didn't end this match with the, the end the night with this match because of the implications of it and how it ended. I figured, what the heck? Why not just have this match be, um, be how the how the show ended? But they didn't. Shane and Dan and, Bran, and Brian, Daniel Bryan are the refs. If Nakamura and Orton are victorious, Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens will be fired. Brian, Brian, Daniel Bryan, and I'm surprised to say this, as I did earlier, Daniel Bryan had the second pop of the night behind Rusev, and that's kind of 
when you have Rusev getting the highest pop of the night, he's an active competitor, not a problem. When the second highest pop of the night, they were rival. They came close, but I believe Rusev was definitely over more. When the second at biggest pop of the night is a referee and of an inactive wrestler in this match who took a little bump. He did tonight. He took a bump. I don't care what anyone says. That was a bump. It was a small one, but he took a bump, and I was surprised they let him do it. So, yes, your biggest pops of the night were Rusev and Daniel Bryan. Rusev, in my opinion, got the first. And Byron Saxton, all up and down, before this match started, talking about how... Wanted to bring up how the authority back in 2014 was a thorn in Daniel Bryan's side and how Randy Orton was on was a part of that thor authority. And how he was just like, Daniel Bryan is going to help, is going to screw um, Nakamura and Nakamura and Orton out of this match. And just on and on and on. And he's just enough of him. When the match, before the match starts, Owen and Zayn are in the ring pretty much getting in um, Shane McMahon's face. About how this, uh, about how, like, all this and this and that. Orton and Zayn starts the match. Zayn talking trash to Orton, or Orton as they lock up. Both refs go for the cover, and Shane looks up to, looks at Daniel Bryan, is like, what are you doing? I'm the main ref, you just stand there. Shane McMahon, from the start, you could just tell, was cheering on Randy Orton and, Shins and, Randy Orton and Shinsuke Nakamura from the start. Every time they would do something, he would get that, like, excitedness. He would start cheering for them. It got bigger and bigger as the night went on. But for the most part, for the most part of this match, and by the way, the card holics, you guys, I saw a sign for you guys in the uh, in the um, crowd, which is a pretty cool thing. Maybe sometime I can see a sign for myself. Who knows? But yeah, I saw that. That was a pretty cool thing. Owens in the match attacking Orton. The guys got back and forth. You would see that for the most part, Owen like Orton, and then like I'm not Orton, but Shane and Daniel Bryan would sit there and actually let these guys. They called the match as best as they could. Again, both men were pounding. Like, they got another pinfall. Both men counted the match. Counted the pinfall. The first time was really ugly because Shane McMahon started counting. Daniel Bryan got down and started counting after him. So they were off. The second time it was a little bit better. Shane gets up and is like, what are you doing? So they decided, that I'm going to stay on Orton's side. With Nak like Shane's like, I'm going to be on Orton and Nakamura's side. GB on Kevin and Sammy's side of the ring. And we'll just go down the middle. Which, for the most part, that worked. They both did it for the most part. Eventually... Owens is talking to Shane and Nakamura. Brian getting Owens is getting on Daniel Bryan about a count early in the match. It was a two count. He said it should have been a three. This match got crazy. It got out of hand. It got to it got to the outside, and Shinsuke Nakamura got put through the announce table with a frog splash by Kevin Owens. While Sami Zayn held him there, both the referees were not happy about this. The match got the match ended, and this was how this match ended. Well, shot, well, this was how this was before the match ended. Tri Shinsuke Nakamura had Owens in a triangle choke, had him in the triangle. He was on. He ended up getting on to Sh Shane's side, and he had his shoulders were down because Kevin Owens had him positioned to that. Daniel Bryan gets down on on the, on the mat and starts counting one, two, and Shane McMahon's like, "What are you doing? What are you doing?" He had a triangle choke. Daniel Bryan's like he had his he had his hand his shoulders down and you know, normally a referee if they see those shoulders down would count one two of the shoulders is down in the triangle choke. Well, of course you know. Then you know Shane McMahon doesn't want these guys to win this match. A hoover kick got blocked and then eventually gets hit with a blue thunder bomb for a two count. That blue thunder bomb is a beautiful looking move. I've never seen him win a match with it, but it is a really good one. Everyone is in the ring and it starts breaking down. They are Daniel Bryan and Shane McMahon try to get Owens and not Owens, but um, Sami Zayn and Randy Orton out of the match. No, uh, Nakamura gets the knees up for a blocking a senton. Zayn and Orton tag in. Orton takes control of the match. Nakamura sent through the announce table as we said earlier. Match ends by Randy Orton hitting an RKO onto Shane on onto Sami Zayn. Shane McMahon goes for the pin. Daniel Bryan sees Kevin Owens coming into this match, runs over to try and push Kevin Owens to stop him from coming in this match. Kevin Owens knocks Ran Ran Daniel Bryan over into Shane McMahon as he's trying to take this cover. And Bryan ends up falling on Shane, and Shane starts berating. Sh starts berating Daniel Bryan. Come on, that was a three count. That was a three. What are you doing? What are you doing? 
Daniel Bryan looks distraught. How did I mess this up? I can't believe this happened. Maybe I shouldn't have been in this match, he's probably thinking. Sammy starts to starts to roll up. Like they would they both did a roll up like the roll up exchange where one rolls up and they push back and forth, back and forth. That happened three times. Then Sami Zayn rolls up Randy Orton. Shane McMahon gets down to do the clear count. One, two, then he just stops with Daniel Bryan behind him. Not with a smile on his face. He's like, you're not winning this way. I'm not gonna let you win this match. Shane McMahon and Daniel Bryan start arguing. Daniel Bryan is not happy about it. Shane McMahon turns his back. Sami Zayn, um, Randy Orton goes for another RKO. Sami Zayn rolls him up. Daniel Bryan gets down, counts the three count three in like 2.5 seconds, if not even that, like maybe 1.5 seconds. For the three count, your winners are Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens. They keep their jobs, which all of us knew they were going to do. Thanks a lot, Mixed Match Challenge. Spoiling that. Post match, Shane is not happy. Randy Orton's not happy. Who tried? Who looked like he was about ready to hit Rand, Shane, um, Daniel Bryan with an RKO earlier when he fell over Dan over Shane McMahon after Kevin Owens pushed him over. So yes, Daniel Bryan took a bump in this match. Was it a big bump? No. Was it a safe bump? Most likely, yes. There was nothing that was going to happen to him. But during, but Daniel Bryan's um, in the is raising Dan is raising the hand of of. Sami Zayn on the outside, and those two celebrate while the uh, while Shane McMahon is like, "Okay, you got me, you got me," and he, and that was how that went. We have those two keeping their jobs, and we will see what happens on Tuesday. And will Shane McMahon see that it wasn't his, it wasn't Daniel Bryan's fault that he got pushed into Shane McMahon? Shane McMahon was put in three count. Daniel Bryan, for whatever reason, decides to go over to try and stop stop. Um, Kevin Owens from coming in the match and gets pushed on to say on to um, gets on to um, gets pushed on to Shane and that led to the and to everything that happened. Then we had the final match of the night: Jinder Mahal versus AJ Styles for the WWE Championship. The Singh brothers, for the first time since they started this whole thing, pretty much, and did not introduce. Jinder Mahal. Jinder Mahal just came out. His music started, and he did have the Singh brothers with him from the start. And for ninety-five percent of this match, the Singh brothers did absolutely nothing in this match. Did you think they were going to go one hundred percent of this match sitting there on the outside? No. But they did. They they. You could just see what happens when you have a guy as awful as the modern day failure Raja, the modern day failure Raja of Jinder Mahal in the match with a. A, a ring general as good as AJ Styles. This guy made Jinder Mahal look like a million bucks, even though there were Jinder Mahal chants ringing throughout the Boston Garden. Beginning at the like towards the beginning of the match, they were outside the barricade. And AJ Styles. Two things were told about this match: AJ Styles' ribs were a problem, and Jinder Mahal's one. Um, I believe it was his right knee or his left knee were also compromised at the beginning of the match. Both guys got something injured on each other. Jinder Mahal is going to definitely hurt somebody with his carelessness because he, going towards the end of this match, they rebuilt, and I don't know why they did this because I guess they needed it for the spot. They rebuilt the announce table for from the mat previous match when, you know, Jinder Mahal, when um, Shinsuke Nakamura was splashed through it. Anyway, he picks JJ Styles up and goes to throw him onto that, and it just looked horrible. But previous before that, they were they were over by that curve, bar the curve part of the barricade, AJ Styles was laying on it, trying to catch his breath, and he falls back and pulls the barricade piece off with him. I knew immediately that's going to get used. It didn't get used in the way I thought it was going to. I figured AJ Styles was going to get thrown into the metal piece that was hanging. But what happened was he th AJ Styles got thrown over the barricade with a bunch of chairs that were just sitting right there because that's usually where they have the chairs when, you know, someone is gets thrown to the outside and they want to pick a chair up. They're usually right there on the other side of that curved piece. So somebody should have moved those because that could have probably, you could have injured AJ Styles when he got thrown over. And I'm going to say, AJ Styles is one of the best sellers in this entire world. Like, he is the best in the wrestler in the game, in my opinion, period. No doubt about it. Especially he is in WWE. My dad and others might not think it, but it's the, it's the truth. And he made Jinder Mahal look great in this match. So great. This match went a good while. 
the match came to close when AJ Styles is take is he just hit he just got it he went for a 450 he could not pin Jinder Mahal because of his ribs he hit the 450 which I thought he was gonna I thought because of where Jinder Mahal was at the time the Singh brothers were going to grab Jinder and pull him out so that AJ Styles would have missed the 450 but he hit the 450 fell off of off of Jinder Mahal Jinder Mahal's he goes to AJ Styles goes to grab Jinder Mahal and pin him. But the Singh brothers grab his legs. AJ Styles grabs Jinder's arms. And it's pretty much a tug of war for a second for Jinder Mahal. Don't want to see that again. AJ Styles is like, I'll forget this. Jumps outside and takes out the Singh brothers. A After he takes out the Singh brothers, he tries to come back in the ring. And ends up getting hit with a Coloss for his troubles. It looked like Jinder Mahal might come away with the title, mat with the title here. He pulls... AJ Styles in the middle of the ring gives him a pin. This referee count right here. I don't blame Jinder for this. I don't blame AJ for this. This referee count looks so slow. He's like one, a two, and he does that hesitation thing that you know he's like someone's gonna kick out. When they put their arm up high and they go to hesitate, you know someone's gonna kick out so that he can go all the way through and look like they 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 just barely didn't count him out. That was just a terrible spot, and that was on the referee. He just made it look so slow. Jinder picks up Styles. Looks like he wants to go for the Styles Clash. AJ ends up reversing that into a calf crusher. And Jinder Mahal taps out after... First off, he got him in the calf crusher. Jinder Mahal comes close to the ropes. AJ Styles lets go of the calf crusher for a minute. Rolls him around. Puts him in the calf crusher again. And Jinder Mahal ends up tapping out. Does this mean Jinder Mahal is out of the WWE Championship pressure? You bet your bottom dollar he better be. And yes, I just said bet you bottom dollar. But that has got to be... It's one thing to get pinned. And you can say, oh, this happened or that happened. But he tapped out. Usually when somebody taps out, like AJ Styles made him tap out tonight, that usually means they're done in that... Like, done. Where do we go from here for the WWE Championship? I honestly do not know. I don't know who's going to be next in line for, Jinder, for AJ Styles. Not Jinder. And this, of course, will be the second year in a row, J AJ Styles, unless something happens in the next two weeks. J AJ Styles will end 2017 and start 2018 the way he started la ended last year and started this year. He will be WWE Champion going into 2018. And that is something that not many people get to do two years in a row without, you know, holding the title for at least a whole year. So, yes, AJ Styles wins. Jinder Mahal, on the other hand, I think it's clear he should be going for the U.S. title. He should go for the U.S. title, beat whomever they want to have him beat at the Royal Rumble, if it's Dolph Ziggler or Baron Corbin or whatever, just have him hold that title and just be the evil foreigner, which they do. It's been done to death, but they still do it. What's going to happen on when it comes to Shinsuke Nakamura, Sami Zayn, Kevin Owens, Randy Orton, and Shane and Daniel Bryan? I'm not sure either. Randy Orton, of course, took the pinfall in this match, so they can't protect Shinsuke Nakamura and didn't make him look weak. Will we see a rematch from what the ticket sales are showing? The tickets from StubHub were showing for this Tuesday night, then that's probably going to be a dark match, in my opinion. A dark match for them, so... What's going to happen? What consequences will we have? I don't know. I don't know where this is leading to. They did let a they did let Daniel Bryan take a bump tonight, so that is signs that WWE might be turning around and might let him wrestle soon. I do not know. But Clash of Champions was not the best show of the year. It so as heck wasn't the worst. That was Battleground. It will always be Battleground. So this pay-per-view calendar for 2018 has come to a close. We will be looking forward to the Royal Rumble in two, in a month and a half. And NXT TakeOver Philadelphia will be heading on to the road for WrestleMania in a month and a half. So there is not much left to say here, except we will be here tomorrow for Raw. And then we were going to SmackDown Live, where we will be dealing with whatever happens here tonight. Also, I don't know if anyone else had the film. I didn't, and it didn't seem to affect me. But there was a there was talk of WWE cutting down the amount of viewers of each, like how many shared um, accounts you could use. Like, say you're at a friend's house and they're watching on the main TV, but you want to watch the WWE Network on their upstairs, like 
on their computer or something, or you're using a friend's account, so it's apparently not supposed to be doing that. They, they cut that down, I guess. But I didn't have that problem. I mean, my dad didn't have that problem. We used the same account, and they didn't seem to have that problem. But if it's going to happen that way, I know why they're doing it. I don't think they should. And another thing, I'll have to say this now. I should have said it at the beginning of the show. But 205 Live is getting tour dates in January, in late, late January, early February. There's three dates. WWE, it could not sell the tickets for this show on, based on the cruiserweights. So, what did they do? They decided, let's put the, the, the Woken Matt Hardy and Bray Wyatt on this show. Let that show. That just shows how much drawing power these cruiserweights have and how much of a messed up job WWE has put, has screwed up these cruiserweights. So you have to have Woken Matt Hardy and Bray Wyatt, who have nothing to do with cruiserweight west wrestling. These guys are both well over 205 pounds, I'm pretty sure. And yet you're going to have these guys on house shows that you, like, basically, here's the thing. If they're the first match of the night and you have, the, you have Woken Matt Hardy versus Bray Wyatt, I guarantee you in all three of those shows, people are going to watch that match, be okay with that match, and then leave. Unless they're going to make that a main event. Then people probably don't want to show up to after. I think that's a... That just shows WWE and Vince McMahon's failure. <coughs> failure <coughs> with these cruiserweights. <coughs> Excuse me. And <coughs> one more thing before we close this. There was a rumor going around, and I came. I woke up yesterday. I woke up, came downstairs, checked my YouTube, see what's going on, see what happens if JD had his up to, off the script on yet. See if Cultaholics has said anything. See if what Cultural Wrestling has said anything yet. <clears throat> I go to the homepage and find this, these five videos of the same conversation between Dave Meltzer and Brian Alvarez that apparently next month, like I believe the week of the Royal Rumble, let me look at this again, the week of the Royal Rumble on January 25th, the Thursday before the Royal Rumble, there's going to be a press conference by Vince McMahon, and he is going to announce the revival of the XFL. Now, me, personally, I have no problem with this if it's done right, because this is actually, like, when he did this the first time, when they did the XFL the first time, the NFL was at its all-time height of popularity-ish. You had a lot of more people who weren't going to give the XFL a chance, and the biggest reason for that was because Vince McMahon and WWE is known for stage um, work, which we all know this is. This is all, it's not fake, it's rehearsed, all of it. We know that. But people, like a lot of people in the mainstream were like, well, they're just, they're just fixing these games. These games have all been predetermined. These games have all been done in, um, in, back in, the, in the back. So that's going to lead to fixed games and they already had their champion played out. If you get because I guess he's going to start up his own business that has nothing to do with WWE and he's supposed to be leaving WWE to go focus on the XFL. And as anyone knows, Vince McMahon's track record on anything that was not WWE has been very bad. Let's think. The WBF, the World Body Mill Federation, that failed. WWE New York, that failed. The XFL the first time failed, which they didn't get a good shake at all just because of how things went. If they were going to bring this back, and there's other things I could probably bring up too. WWE Niagara Falls. Bet you don't bet you a lot of people don't know what WWE Niagara Falls was. That failed too, and it ended up closing shop. But that's just four examples. And he wants to bring this one back. So if he's really dedicated to this, he's gonna have to cut himself off from WWE completely. He can't be a part of WWE and also be a part of the XFL. He has to be cut off from WWE completely. Give the trains over to Triple H and Stephanie McMahon and Shane McMahon. And let them run the company. Go do his XFL thing. And do and just be done with wrestling. If he does that and actually puts in a good effort and has the right people in place, it will do fine. None of this stupid little um, storyline things where they had... Jesse Ventura trying to build a fake story, like a fake feud with one of the coaches. Don't do any of that. And if you're going to announce this, don't put 
don't go out and get players that are just out of college and start mini camp three months before this three months before you got to give this thing a year go out say this is going to happen and then 2020 2020 or 2000 or 2019 or 2020 and start recruiting players now don't recruit players later recruit players now and there's also some players out there like maybe a Tim Tebow maybe a um uh, there's another one too. I can't think of it. Like get Colin Kaepernick over there. Get all these players that like don't just go for college players. Go for players that actually know how to play. Don't change the rules as much as you did last time. Don't do that stupid. Let's run to get the football. Just do a coin toss. Will we see that work out? I don't know. I have a, I'm part of this um, Discord channel and people were excited to see the XFL come back. I'm just gonna sit there and be optimistic. We'll see what happens. But that is going to be your Clash of Champions review. Make sure to like, share, subscribe. Find me on Twitter at The Branch. Find me on twitch.tv slash The Branch. Every Monday, every every day from 12 to 7. Well, 12 to when, uh, 2 to whenever, unless I say otherwise. And I will see you guys tomorrow for Monday Night Not Raw review. The night show was not too bad. Was it the best I've ever seen? No. Was it the worst I've ever seen? No. And But that is all. I will see you.